Hey there, everyone, and welcome to Twin Movies. I'm Ben Phelps, and I'm joined by my regular buddy in banter. Hello, Gabe Darrick. Hello, that's me. Hello. Hello, Gabe. Every year, Hollywood releases two movies based on the same idea. So we ask the big question, which movie did it better? Today, we'll be reviewing two, and I won't say classic movies, let's (laughs) just say two twin movies about an incompetent security guard at a shopping mall who finds himself out of his league when he tries to win the heart of a woman who works in the very same mall by saving her from an unexpected criminal. It's Paul Blart, Mall Cop versus Observe and Report. Let the security games begin. So, Gabe, let's kick off this episode with an overview of these twin movies and our flashback to our first encounter with them. On the 16th of June, 2009, Paul Blart was released. Here's the IMDb synopsis. When a shopping mall is taken over by a gang of organised crooks, it's up to a mild, mannered security guard to save the day. So Gabe, I imagine this is the sort of film that you would have been waiting outside the front doors of the cinema to on day one at 10am to catch the very first screening, if not attending the red carpet premiere. Am I right? You're correct. I even rode my... What's the gadget that Paul Blart rides called? What's that thing called? The Segway. Segway. I even rode my Segway there. I watched the movie on a Segway. This is a weird movie because while watching it this morning, I swear there's parts of it I'd seen, and I must have seen it in increments along the way, but I don't think I'd ever- In nightmares. Yeah, that's right. I don't think I'd ever sat down and watched the whole thing until- In fact, I've never sat down and watched the whole thing. In preparation for this, I've watched it in about three parts. I wanted to savour those parts. Just really savour them. So, what about you? Did you see this on a Segway at a mall? I did neither of those things, neither on the Segway nor at the mall. I caught this specifically for this podcast, and it was a torturous experience, (laughs) which we'll get to in the review. Yeah, I just watched it on a streaming service. Look, it was a difficult watch for me. I sat down, and I did it for the pod. So, for all the listeners out there, not all of these films are gems, not all of these are pearls. It was difficult for you because of your own history as a security guard. Oh, well, totally. Like, it just brought back bad memories that time back in 1992 on my work experience. A day when I was a kid at high school and I was asked to uh, join a young man by the name of Ronaldo Smith, who was a security guard at the local mall. <laughs> It was a bad day that day. Really? Gay, very bad day. Wow. Things were pear shaped very, very quickly. I'm sure watching Observe and Report then was most definitely PTSD inducing. Very much so. I was trembling. My hands were like just shaking. And uh, yeah, I went to the toilet twice wow. in the first two minutes. So yeah, not a great experience. Perhaps we should move on to the next okay. one Observe and Report. So later on, on the 10th of April 2009, Observe and Report was released. Here's its IMDb synopsis. Bipolar Paul security guard Ronnie Barnhart is called into action to stop a flasher from turning a shopper's paradise into his personal peep show. But when Barnhart can't bring the culprit to justice, a surly police detective is recruited to close the case. So Gabe, talk me through when and how you first watched Observe and Report. I must have seen this on DVD back in 2009. I definitely didn't see this at the movies. I'm not sure if anyone saw this at the movies. Did this get a cinema release in Australia? I can't recall. I think it did. Right. But I discovered it via the Q&A podcast with Jeff Goldsmith, where they spoke to the director, Jody Hill. Right. And at the time, it was being promoted as pretty subversive. And I guess the darker version of the security mall guard you know, films of that year. So I think I caught it myself on DVD as well. Yeah, I've seen it a couple of times since. It is the darker version of the two security guard films, although I have a memory of it perhaps being marketed as being lighter than it is, because this is a pretty dark movie. Yeah, I agree. I recall it being marketed as much more of a an accessible comedy. Like, let's just say The 40-Year-Old Virgin, which was 2004, so five years before this, but starring Seth Rogen as well. That film was really rude and racy, but it wasn't dark. It was actually very good-natured in many respects. And I actually think that film, despite having the same sort of, you know, R rating, MA15 classification, is much more accessible to a mainstream audience, which we'll get to in our reviews, than this one, which 
I think I recall actually had a, a much more chipper poster as well, whereas the poster for this one is quite indie. It got the same sort of poster, though, observe and report, as the sort of 40-year-old virgin and knocked up. You know, it's just a big close-up of Seth Rogen's face. I mean, he's not doing that goofy smile like Carell on the front of 40-year-old virgin, but it definitely feels like it's trying to exist within that sort of the marketing anyway of the Apatow universe of comedy, whereas I think it's got a, a darker heart than that. Yeah, you might be right. Let's get that in our poster. Oh, yes, okay, of course. Each other. Maybe we should just jump straight into a review of both these movies. So let's start with Paul Blart. What are your thoughts? How many shock tops out of five do you give it? I like bad comedies. I mean, I'll watch any of the Happy Madison movies that Adam Sandler's production company makes. Kevin James isn't my favourite member of that ensemble, but this is not a great movie, is it? It is a terrible movie, and there are so many reasons why. <laughs> yeah. I just want to be nice to it a little bit before I just sink the boot in. <laughs> okay. Let's start on the positives, shall we? Bobby Cannavale is in the movie. That's a positive. Okay. Whether- That's automatically a positive. Okay, yeah. His character sucks. He actually <laughs> cleans up a few awards down the track in this podcast. So, yeah, there are a few shout-outs to Bobby down the track. Look, there are a few things that this film does well. Kevin James, for many people, and many people it doesn't include me, seems like a pretty good-natured, fun fella, and he has a sweetness to him, and he betrays himself as a good father, and it does a few surprising things. I'm not sure if it's actually courageous or racist in relation to the way it treats the mother who abandoned him and his daughter, so his ex-wife. She's described as a ex-Mexican migrant and then married him for his green card and then took off, which- It doesn't really sound particularly courageous. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, depiction. but in terms of like, he's raised this daughter by himself. He seems like a very kind of open-minded, friendly guy and very nice to people around him. I am really scratching the barrel here to try and think of good Nothing attributes to, to assign to this film. Look, it gave- a plug to Segway, and that's good because Segway is a remarkable device. Yeah. And the fact that someone actually gave it quality time, not just in the film, but actually on the poster, I think the way that that inventor was able to create a device that manages to somehow keep you upright using a very complex system of internal gyroscopes should be applauded. And if this film gave any publicity to Segways, I'm happy for that. Okay, that's very kind. Segways suck, but that's all right. Okay, well, what doesn't work for you in this movie? Okay, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Right, let's scene go. one. Scene one. Actually, before we really put the boot in, I will say that the actual premise of following a frustrated security guard who probably feels very judged by society and is probably hard on himself and wishes he was actually a cop is actually a great concept. I think in some respects, this is actually the diehard formula which is one of the awards in our podcast series, in that you have an ordinary person in an extraordinary circumstance and he essentially rises to the challenge single-handedly most of the time to save a group of hostages or a damsel in distress in Observe and Report. So that premise by itself isn't too bad and it could very much work well to play off against the insecurity of a character who's in those shoes – Paul Platt seems pretty happy to be a security guard and I guess, I don't know, bless perhaps, like good for him. So I like the concept itself and there's stuff to do with that concept. Everyone goes to shopping malls, people have seen security guards. There's something that works in that regard. But I don't know, this film, it just frustrates me. Kevin Smith is an acquired taste James, as Kevin a comedian. James. Kevin James. Sorry, Kevin. Kevin Smith's get, get great. Your fat white guys are. Uh... Yeah, that's right. They all look the same. Kevin James is in a quiet taste. I never got to his TV show called, what, King of Queens or something? No. Yeah, King of Queens. What was that? King of Queens. So I'm not the King of Queens, How Great Is Raymond, whatever that show's called. Everyone loves Raymond. Don't you <laughs> dare just mix up uh, Ray Romano with Kevin James. Ray Romano is actually great. A little segue as a dramatic actor yeah. in recent years. Yeah. I actually like the sort of new version of Ray Romano. Romano, that's good, you know, or whatever you want to call. Yeah, it. Yeah, totally. That's great. I like, I'm all for that. So, look, I just think Kevin James isn't a particularly interesting actor. He's got some charm, I suppose. I think the story's pretty dumb. There are no surprises. The Segway stuff is just ridiculous. The Segway 
in some ways, is just a really try-hard prop that they flog to death. And I think the segue probably counts if you actually would apply some algorithm to assess the laughs in this film, if any laughs can be determined. I would say the segue is trying to prop up 25% of those laughs in the entire film. Yeah, probably. Those laughs should be funny because physical comedy, I mean, that's the hardest one to go wrong with. Someone just falling off a segue or whatever. For me, it felt like the segue was there. And then they were like, oh, what should the villains be? They should be like the radical version of segue writers. So they're like skateboarders. And it just seems so lame. Oh, I completely forgot. Yes. I watched this film so recently, I've already buried it in the deep bowels of my memory. Yeah, yeah. And I completely forgot about the fact that the criminals, and not just one, but several, are, quote, badasses, unquote, and ride skateboards in the mall. Or do parkour. It really ticks a whole bunch of, like, boxes. Oh, yeah, parkour was popular in the, you know, mid-2000s. Let's bang that in. Skateboarding was popular in the early 2000s. Let's bang that in a few years late. (laughs) For the audience who hasn't seen this film so far, and we're going to save you the trouble of that and perhaps point you towards Observe and Report as the better of these two films that rely on the same premise. In Paul Blart, the criminals who ride skateboards ride skateboards for no particular reason. They've come to the mall with skateboards. Maybe they travelled to the mall on skateboards. It's unclear. (laughs) Possibly. But they kind of all resemble Tony Hawk past his prime in that they're probably only about early 30s, but it looks just immature and silly. And this is coming from me, who actually rides an electric skateboard, but does it ironically and understanding that I'm more than a decade older than I should be to be on this little vehicle. To watch these characters in this film on skateboards, it does feel so try-hard. And I think you're right. They're trying to set these guys up as the triple X film type baddies like that Vin Diesel film. They're the the exciting, dangerous, sexy criminals compared to Tubby Paul Blart, played by Kevin James, on his pretty unsexy segue. Yeah. I mean, your electric skateboard should just be a topic of another podcast. That's a choice. But- <laughs> A choice is the worst backhand for saying it's a bad choice. Hey, look, you know, you do what you got to do, man. You do what you got to do. But it's weird having these guys as the villains because it makes them, in a way, completely non-threatening. Totally. It's like this odd affectation. And look, absolutely no problem with skateboarding. I, I myself skateboarded for two years between 1995 and 1997. Could, Ollie. The Tony Hawk glory is. That's right. But um, just... Them skateboarding around the malls, you just can't take a villain doing that seriously. And look, yeah, it's a comedy, so oh, you might say, well, why should we take the villains seriously? But if the basic premise of the movie is, as you described it, he's this schlubby security guard who will have to rise to the occasion to beat the villains and no one thinks he can, well, at least make the villains a, a challenge and not a bunch of, like, over-the-hill skateboarders and is there a BMX? Oh, I can't remember. I don't recall a BMX, but what I recall is I watched it and thought – This reminds me of something goofy, but I just can't quite put my finger on it. And then by sheer coincidence, five days later, I watched Back to the Future 2 with my kids. And there's this scene where Biff in the future has this kind of extendable bat that comes out and these sort of shoes that grow where the sole increases. And he actually rides on a floating hoverboard to try and whack Marty McFly. And it's like fun and silly and very much in the spirit of being that sort of, uh, I don't know, when we're doing the set 2017 or whatever, like set in the distant future and that's all fun. But that's a film set in the future with its tongue very firmly pushed into its cheek and suits the tone of that particular series. This film here, which is more naturalistic in comparison, it just seems silly. It just seems silly. And you're right. Like, what is less threatening than a wannabe 30-year-old gothic skateboarder riding on a skateboard, not particularly quickly, by the way, I might add, towards you in a giant shopping mall? Yeah. I mean, yeah, totally. Kevin James can't be a fast runner, but in some scenes, it appears he's even trying to run slower, if that's possible, to give the skateboard a chance to catch up to him. Yeah, I feel like this movie didn't learn the lessons of like 2008's Punisher Warzone, 
which for me really drew a line under parkour on cinema when Punisher, Mr. Warzone, fires a rocket at the guy doing parkour and he just explodes in midair and totally blows him to pieces. And to me, that's what parkour in movies should be. It's not the actual parkour. It's the person doing parkour being blasted out of the sky that people actually want to see. That's awesome. That's fantastic. <laughs> and truly, watching this movie made me wish I was watching Punisher Warzone. Okay, what else? <laughs> what else doesn't work in this film? So they don't have any interesting criminals at all. There aren't any interesting side security guards, like supporting characters. I don't find the lead actress to be particularly interesting. And I'm really surprised, actually, that Observe and Report got Anna Faris, who was pretty mainstream at that stage and had done a few of those teen comedies and so on, as the attractive love interest that's kind of way above, what's his name, Ronnie, in terms of being out of Ronnie's mm. league. In this film, this is a film produced by Adam uh, Adam Spacey. No, Kevin Spacey. No, oh, Adam Sandler. Right. I'm Gee. confusing all of Hey, listen, the Sandman, if you're listening to this, I'm so sorry that he said that. You're awesome. <laughs> oh, jeez. Anyway. That name stumble just took a very dark path and went through various social figures who are infamous and famous for various reasons. So in this particular film, I'm surprised an Adam Sandler film couldn't have actually attracted a lead actor who was a bigger name or, I don't know, more interesting. She was okay. She was fine. But- if they actually had someone who had a bit more agency, a bit more pizzazz, a bit more personality, she doesn't have to be attractive, but just be a bit more energetic on screen. I actually thought this was Anna Faris. I was going to say, I can't believe that Anna Faris is in actually both movies. I actually thought the same thing. I didn't thing. realize that until you just told me then. And I almost said earlier when you introed these movies, oh, and they both star Anna Faris. But it turns out this isn't Anna Faris. This is someone named Jama Mays. Yeah, this is like I a poor what? Hollywood's Anna Faris. Oh, man. Yeah. Mind blown. Wow. She'd been in heaps of stuff. I mean, I haven't seen most of this. Who, Anna Faris no, or No, no, Jama, Jama Mays. Wow. I actually, until this week, I had never seen her in a film ever before. And I've looked at IMDb, and she actually has quite an extensive filmography and has been like a central character in quite a few prominent TV shows. So I'm surprised as well I hadn't seen her before at all. I didn't even recognise her. So maybe she's just part of those TV shows I don't watch. And maybe she actually is part of the Adam Sandler world. And I don't watch those films like Grown Ups and so on. So that's why I never saw her. Anyway, She was in a movie with Anna Faris. She was in Greg Arakai's Smiley Face. And I think that's where she was actually born. It was like an amoeba splitting or whatever. They just, Anna Faris just birthed this other version of her. No, it's like in the Bible where they took a rib out of Adam yeah, and then go. created okay. Eve. They took a rib out of Anna Faris and then created James. Wow, I can't believe this wasn't Anna Faris. Okay, anyway, fuck. All my talking points are they're gone now. Jesus. All your comedy. Uh, I had so many bits about Anna Faris being in both of these movies and you could cut them together and it's not even her. Fuck. No. Oh. All right. Well, let's talk about Bobby Carnival. Now, you talk about making big choices. Bobby Carnival makes some big acting choices. Bobby Carnival is there chewing the scenery and loving life, and I'm pretty sure he's just getting a paycheck. So I've just described three possible awards he's just won in 30 seconds. He's looking good. He's looking very slick, looking like the handsome, suave person that Kevin James's character would like to be. Yeah, Fair to yeah say? he's well cast in that regard. I mean, who doesn't aspire to be Carnivale? Exactly. You know, he does his indie films, he does his mainstream films, and yeah, I think he has good presence here and provides a good alternative. What did you think of the twist, spoilers ahead, Where that he Bobby Carnival is in on this? Yeah. Well, pretty terrible. I mean, I guess from a screenplay point of view on some sort of like basic level idea, it makes sense. He's the guy that Blart sort of aspired to be. He's the best police cop there is. He needs to be sort of defeated. I mean, I guess I expected him just to give Paul Blart the old thumbs up, good job, maybe offer him a a permanent position on Jersey SWAT or whatever they are, but I don't know. That doesn't really sort of make sense, though, because in the end, it's um, Peter Geraghty's character who shoots the gun out of Bobby Carnivale's hand. Paul Blart doesn't actually defeat this guy. So No, not at all. What's the sort of point, I guess? I thought basically the point would be that 
Bobby had, we find out that Bobby had been essentially a bully to Paul Blart at school. So here we are, worlds colliding, where 20 years post school, and suddenly this smug, good looking guru from what Jersey SWAT, as you say, is now holding the reins this operation and essentially demeaning Paul Blart's character. And so it makes sense for Paul Blart to basically save the day and also stop this bully from school days gone past. But you're right, that doesn't happen. The only character who fits that look of that generic copy you've seen before saves the day and Paul Blart doesn't really do anything to stop Bobby in any capacity at all. Yeah, you could just trim that part off the end, I guess. But it's a weird choice. It's an odd choice. It's a weird choice. Shall we push past this and just get to observe okay, report? Okay, sure, sure. Done. All right. Observe and report. Did you like it? Yes. I like this movie. I I think this is quite an interesting movie. It certainly exists within that realm of movies that just seem to go out of their way to be kind of cynical and mean-spirited and just hateful. <laughs> um, and uh, most of it works for me. <laughs> yeah, I actually love it. I actually love it, Starcart. This film is mean-spirited. It's funny. Some of the comments made by the main characters to Ronnie are hilarious. Like, and some of the characters that pop up before they were famous, some of the borderline, well, actually, it's not, I was going to say borderline racist, but some of the racist comments Ronnie makes, which are funny to laugh at Ronnie for saying them because he comes across as an absolute tool, are hilarious the way it characterizes him as just a very narrow minded, thick as two bricks character. When he tries to discriminate against people or to impress them, whatever, he comes across as a tool. But he's a lovable tool. I know I actually think Is he? it's a very, very funny film. No, you're right. No, that was a mistake. I should say he's an interesting tool. Okay, yeah, yeah. So we've talked before about this idea that some unsophisticated screenwriters or producers or marketing people think you need to have good characters for the audience to root for. And the history of cinema and almost every Martin Scorsese film demonstrates that you don't have to have likable characters. You need to have interesting characters. And those interesting characters can be good or they can be bad. But to engage the audience, they need to be interesting. And this guy is interesting. He's deeply flawed. I wouldn't throw the term bipolar around, but it was used in the IMDb synopsis, so I'll use it. But the, I mean, the character's but he on meds for has, that, So, like, I think yeah, you could- Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's got mental health issues. And I think Jody Hill said in the making of that it was inspired by films like King of Comedy, for example, or Taxi Driver in that you've got this person who's mentally unwell and they see life through a very specific lens and it's not the correct lens necessarily, and that, but they go ahead and make choices and hurt people and hurt themselves in spite of that. And I just find this film hilarious. Like there are so many things that are odd, like the two twin security guards- Oh, they're great. Who play, the characters' names are the names of the real life People, I would say actors, except for the fact that they basically acted in nothing else. And they're hilarious. And I'm not sure where they came from or why they're in this particular film, but they're great. And there are just so many funny supporting characters like Michael Penner. Ah, oh, so good. Ray Liotta yeah, sort of channeling some of his menacing characters from films like Goodfellas. Turbulence. Um, Anna Ferris doing what she does well. Turbulence. <laughs> it's funny. Like, this film is funny. Um. The full-on frontal shots of the streaker at the end, where he sees I guess his tackle out. Yep. white belly and the tiny penis. Like, it is just funny. And when that streaker starts in the first opening, flashing in the car park, it's just ludicrous and hilarious. And the film is very funny, and I actually think it's aged mainly well. We'll get to the uh, date rape oh, yeah. scene later, which is was pretty controversial then and it's arguably more controversial now. But all in all, I think it's a pretty courageous film. I think it's a fun film. And I like films that basically have interesting characters and a sense of darkness to them and this does all of that. Yeah, it certainly feels unique in the it feels like Jody Hill was going for a pretty specific tone. I would say he nailed that tone, though it is definitely not a tone for everybody. Yeah, I agree. I like that the movie goes all the way with its ideas. And it's certainly, you're 100% right. It's particularly in light of the ending of the movie. It feels like Taxi Driver, 
was a huge inspiration. And I think it really gets right that idea of, you know, that there's these security guards or people who are attracted to power and they're not, those people aren't always of a state of mind that they should be given even just a, a baton and any sort of dominion even over something like a mall. So, yeah, I mean, it does a lot of the same beats as Paul Blart, but just better. The character of Ronnie wants to be a cop, but he can't be a cop. Yeah, I like it. Jesse Plemons turns up in an early role. Yeah, in terms of uh, casting, I think Jodie Hill, the director, did a great job in anticipating the expertise some of the cast in supporting roles who have gone on to be main characters in film since then. So heads up to him and his casting director for spotting talent and including them in this film 10 years ago. I think the issue in relation to insecure security guards at shopping malls is interesting in both films but explored better here because it ties into some of those concepts we've seen in films about the Stanford prison experiment and the idea that some people relish being in control. Mm. And for listeners who can't recall what the Stanford prison experiment was, it's that story you've heard before, I'm sure, where they took a group of young men, I think, in their like sort of what, early 20s or late teens, and they essentially created a faux prison environment where they split the group into two and they had security guards on one side and the other guys were playing prisoners. And what they observed over about a week is this really fast decline in terms of the way that people quickly threw aside their traditional moral compass and the people playing security guards actually became quite sadistic. This is a generalisation, but a lot of them became quite sadistic and really cherished the sense of power whilst playing security guards and the prisoners became very subservient. And this only lasted like a few days and they called the whole thing off faster than, ex- than expected. And that particular experiment, that social experiment done at Stanford University, has actually been adapted into a film several times. And I think you see elements of the prison guard psyche, particularly in Observe and Report, in these lead characters, in that they're people who want to experience power, but maybe aren't the right sort of people you want to see have power. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. I mean, I don't think we get any of that in Paul Blart, but this certainly does. But Observe and Report particularly does that. I mean, just spoilers, at the end when Ronnie kills, does he kill him? No, shoots, wounds the um, streaker. That's presented very heroically and he gets his job back and so on. But essentially he shot an unarmed guy in the back. I like the way that that sort of is in the same way that Travis Bickle, that beat at the end of Taxi Driver is played as if this thing he has done is heroic when it's far more sort of morally ambiguous than that. See, I didn't interpret it as heroic at all. I thought that when he did it, it's heroic up until he pulls the gun out and then pulls the trigger. But when he pulls the trigger and suddenly the slow motion stops and the guy just falls down Everyone around Ronnie kind of goes, what the fuck have you done? No, but like, I agree, but the character of Ronnie is given his job back. Oh, yeah. After that. The character is rewarded for doing something that, yeah, you're right, is not heroic whatsoever. And only because the streaker survives. Because initially, the security guard head or the head of the shopping center, like, freaks out. But once the guy starts spluttering and it's clear that he's actually going to be okay- then it's like great relief and then they kind of go, okay, you're a hero for stopping it. Maybe he went too far, but you're a hero for stopping him. That's right. I like that. I feel like, I guess, on that level, this movie's not one for the depiction is endorsement crowd. Yeah, well, that's interesting because we're, t- we're doing this podcast around the same time that uh, Joker, the Wacken Phoenix film, is coming out. And so this is that whole issue, isn't it, about is depiction of something an endorsement of? And the answer I will definitively say is, of course not. Yeah, no, that's right. Like- it depends on the type of depiction. It depends if the violence is glorified, but just showing violence per se is not endorsing violence. It depends on how that violence is shown. That's right. And the movie, Observe and Report, definitely goes out of its way to present Ronnie as unhinged. He quits his meds. He has, like, sort of thoughts of violent ideation. I mean, fuck, he beats up a shit ton of police. How does he not go to jail for that? Yeah, I agree. It's so bizarre. Like, he's clearly mentally unstable. 
this is the hilarious part about this film being an indie film in many respects. I mean, it's made with a Hollywood budget, but it's an indie film in terms of sensibilities. And the fact that he actually, at the end, gets his job back and is rewarded isn't justified in any possible way because the guy is a loose cannon. But it's, it is hilarious. And when he beats up all those security, uh, all of those police who are trying to arrest him, quite reasonably, I might add. He beats them up reasonably or they're trying to arrest him reasonably? The latter. Yes, right. And there's no comeuppance for him at all in any way. So, yeah, that's hilarious. I do also like some of the details with his mum. Oh, she's great. I find her hilarious. Yeah, like, yeah. It's one thing for him to be throwing away his medication and that's not an excuse for his behaviour, but it's a reason for it. But- I also just love the fact that he has a mother who is not going to provide any foundation of stability in his life in any way or call him on any of his BS. She's just a functional, in fact, not even functional, she's an alcoholic who pretty much has is basically a ball and chain around his around him and only wants to sort of mess with his life more by potentially fucking his friends. Like it's <laughs> <Yeah>. just hilarious. <laughs> but I also do like the plot with Michael Penner's character, who seems to sincerely quite like Ronnie, and you think, oh, this is great. Like, Ronnie's going to get a new friend, and this is fantastic. And then totally just betrays him. Well, like, he does send him just, the postcard later as just a little bit of attempt. What, a postcard, despite the fact that he, <laughs> Paul, you know, he almost lost his job, yeah, you know, he's his friend, he's betrayed. That's hilarious. Like, that guy, Michael Penner, comes across as being – a really lovable guy with that kind of high pitched voice He's and so very great soft and sweet, and then he basically just proves himself to be a really selfish bastard. So yeah, it's great. that's an unexpected turn as well. Like you don't have these characters who are, have good traits who try and redeem Ronnie Seth Rogen's character at all. They just kind of exist to be like they all seem like well crafted three dimensional characters that have their own problems, and none of them are going to be there to help out Ronnie in any capacity. Yeah, I love the montage where um, Dennis and Ronnie um, sort of become best buddies. They do they do drugs together, and just prior to Dennis wanting to rob more of the mall, it's a great little sequence. It's a great little sequence, and you could agree that Michael Pena makes some big choices in this movie with his character, and they all pay big off. Big choices, they all pay off. Yeah, in that case, when you use the word choices or big choices, you're being flattering to Michael. That's Pena. right. That's right. When you say it to me that I make choices about writing. And electric skateboard, you're being derogatory. That's right. It's like, forget about it. It can mean many things. <laughs> I always love any film that has a montage sequence. And because of the way we've been inculcated through a movie, mise en scene, to try and interpret a montage as spanning usually days or weeks. I love this montage sequence where they're doing drugs and they're drinking and they're having all these adventures. And then the end, it, I think it's like revealed to only have been like a day or so. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> like, it's just hilarious. Like, that works really well and just plays with our expectations of, of the audience. Let me mention a few things which haven't aged well. Now, again, just because someone says something, it doesn't mean it's an endorsement of what they say. It's just what they say. And if the person's a criminal, particularly, or a complicated grey character, that shapes that characterization. There are, having said that, some liberal uses of retard and faggot used in this film, which are so f interesting to hear now because even though the filmmakers aren't endorsing the use of those words, 10 years since this film was made have gone by. And I actually don't think you could have those words in a film today, in an, even an indie black comedy, very easily, unless it was a film written by, who's the guy that wrote that film in Bruges? What's his name? Oh, Martin McDonough. Yeah. Only Martin McDonough, his brother, can get away with that type of language or- They might also use it with a little bit more sophistication because I agree there's, there is definitely some jokes in Observe and Report that feel like they're really only just going for shock at hearing something. Like, oh, wow, you know, like a little bit of the stuff with um, Aziz Ansari's character and like you say, using some of those terms- they just feel like, even by 2009, it felt like that was just a little bit, just, you sort of expect that from a movie in 2001, like Fast and Furious. Whereas here, it just feels just a tad like, ah, eh. simply hearing the thing as a piece of shock value in comedy is kind of not enough. You have to, you have to subvert it. Just a, and I get that the whole movie is a sort of subversion, but just maybe it's just not quite. Yeah, it's funny because in 2004, you had all of that kind of humour 
kind of like discriminatory language used, I think, by the Indian American older guy who works in the store mm. with the characters. But I think he's the one who's using the language opposed to being used against him. Whereas this one here, Ronnie's actually making some pretty damn derogatory comments about the racial heritage of Aziz Azara's character. And yeah, it does feel like a bit cringy. And in 2009, it would have stuck out a bit. It feels a bit cheap. And something that if you saw it in, a, in an Eddie Murphy comedy from the 80s, it'd be less surprising. Still not excusable, but less surprising. And to be fair, I guess, of the time in terms of its comedy norms. But yeah, it just feels a bit inappropriate in this film. And the other controversial part, of course, which received a lot of attention at the time and I don't think would be included in the film if released in 2019, is the rape scene. Well, that sounds harsh to say that way, but it's like a it's a non-consensual sex scene. I believe the definition of that is... Um... Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I guess the way it is played is a bit more ambiguous. But yeah, it does feel like it's um, the way... Because he doesn't actually try to get her drunk in for the reason of having sex with her. They're both drinking a lot. And then he gives her the medication that he himself has been having for his bipolar condition. But nonetheless, the outcome is that she kind of like loses her senses. And she does wake up and sort of say, why'd you stop? Which kind of implies that she isn't necessarily against it, but nor does she actually explicitly agree with it. It's a bit dicey. And uh, yeah, it doesn't age well at all. And I suppose the benefit of the scene is it does definitely characterise Ronnie, Seth Rogen's character, as being pretty morally messy and being a pretty kind of messed up character in general. So I guess that's the one advantage, but it is uncomfortable to watch. What did you think? I agree with everything you've said. I think if this film was released today, there would be some fair critical analysis of that scene and why was it Included because it essentially exists as almost like a punchline, and exactly, yeah, I don't know. It definitely is a little icky. I mean, it's a movie. The whole movie sits right on the edge of what you can, what sits on the edge of the darker edge of comedy. And I guess sometimes you're going to sort of tip over that edge, but that scene hasn't aged well. But you know, it's in there, and we can point out and talk about it and agree. It's in the SWOT analysis of this movie. It's in the probably in the weaknesses column. So, anything else you want to discuss in our review before we move on to a bit of behind-the-scenes trivia and the awards? Now, tell me some trivia. So, like we said up the front, Paul Blart was the first one released. But the story goes, told by Seth Rogen, that each film knew the other film was being made at the same time. And in a sense of camaraderie and so on, they actually sent pictures to each other just to make sure that people weren't you know, dressed the same way scenes didn't look the same, so that at least if they were going to be making two films based on the same idea, it didn't appear that they would be too similar. Having said that, Seth Rogen contradicted himself in 2019 and said that he expressed anger at his discovery that Paul Blart had, quote, gotten the script and ripped us off, even though they're very different movies. One way or another, I'm not thrilled with Paul Blart, more cop, in relation to how Observe and Report was received. Huh. So apparently, the I may have at the time pretended everything was A-OK, -okay, but behind the scenes, they're both frustrated. And yeah, Seth Rogen actually thinks that their script was actually ripped off. I mean, it's one of those pair of movies that I'm surprised in a way that this movie hadn't been made before. And I agree, like you said earlier, I mean, it's essentially Die Hard or something. But just the idea of like a security guard who could never make it as a cop having to rise to the occasion to stop a bunch of criminals within a mall. I mean, that sort of elevator pitch seems like an obvious movie. Yeah, totally. I agree. Maybe it has. Maybe there's like some 1986 film, which is this movie. This is definitely one of those twin movies. That's funny that both these movies came out at the, at the same time. And maybe Rogan's right. Maybe someone within the Happy Madison camp got a hold of Jody Hill's script and thought, hey, this is a good idea for a, a movie. But certainly we don't want to do the dark version of this. The dopier, lighter version will probably appeal to a much wider audience. Spoilers, it probably did. But yeah, it's just interesting that this hasn't been made before. Well, they often say, don't they, that the best ideas are the ones that you 
just assume have been made already because it just seems so obvious, but haven't been made, in which case it's a great sign it should be made. So I'm surprised as well. It just seems like a no-brainer. Interestingly, I think the best way to take this film is as a comedy, but maybe in our little pitch down the track, we can actually consider doing a drama version. Oh, yes. The White House Down of, or the Die Hard of Mall Cops, which would probably just be Die Hard in a shopping mall. Which would be Security, starring Antonio Banderas, released in 2017. Oh, really? Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, here are a few more facts. Uh, apparently, Warner Brothers was concerned about the dark subject matter and demanded the production team come up with a softer version of the film. But it wasn't until test audiences gave the edited, softer version poorer test scores that they decide to bring back the original version after all and release it in its original form. So good example of you try and dilute something that's been designed out of the gate to be a certain type of story, you're just going to basically have a Frankenstein film that isn't cute enough and nor is it edgy enough. Yeah, I can't really imagine that version of this movie. I mean, I presume they're not talking about cutting it down to a PG-13 version it to be about 24 minutes long. I guess they I probably- There'd would be nothing left. Maybe just sanding off the sort of maybe the, the harder edges. But um, yeah, what works for this movie is it goes all the way, right? Exactly. I mean, at least the director, Jody Hill, and the writer uh, committed to this. Like, if we're going to do this type of story, let's lean into it and do the darkest, most controversial version of it, which they've done. So props to them for at least sticking to their guns and- Credit to Warner Brothers for actually deciding that better release the edgy version than a 24-minute short film, <laughs> yeah. which no one's going to see. Now, casting woulda, shoulda, couldas. So apparently, Jody Hill actually wanted Danny McBride in the role that Seth Rogen's in as Ronnie, but the studio wanted someone who was more bankable. So Seth Rogen got that role. So then Jody Hill went to his backup plan of trying to cast Danny McBride as Detective Harrison, but there was a clash with McBride's schedule, and as a result, Ray Liotta got the role, which is why McBride appears, albeit for only one scene, which he squeezed in whilst filming something else. Yeah, right. I mean, I don't think you'd want to change Ray Liotta. I think he's perfectly cast in this. But McBride as Ronnie, I think that'd be a pretty interesting film. Yeah, I think McBride could easily have played Ronnie, and I think that would have made the film as interesting possibly even better because McBride's older and he would have come across as more of a sad sack. And I think he's not visually as likable in terms of – maybe he would have come across as too dark, actually, because in some respects Seth Rogen actually, to me, is a bit of a goof. So when he does the dark stuff, it doesn't come across as too edgy. I wonder but if McBride, it- McBride, yeah. it would have come across worse. Like McBride in that sex scene would have been a bit creepy, I think. I wonder if – if you had McBride in the lead, he, Danny McBride has a style of acting. Look, I think he's- Big choices. Look, I was going to say, while his range is limited, what he does, he does exceptionally well. And he does that thing where he play, often plays these kind of very characters who are just sort of like belligerent assholes. And he makes them pretty likable. I mean, he's made a career basically out of that sort of even satirising himself as that in This Is The End. And I wonder if, if he had played the character of Ronnie, he would have been much less of a sort of pathetic loser. Seth Rogen has that kind of like a synonym for pathetic vibe about him, schlubby sad sack. Whereas McBride sort of always plays high status, even if he is has a job you would necessarily wouldn't consider high status. He's got that sort of bravado to him. And it would have been an interesting version of the character. That's assuming that he played the character like he plays other characters. Maybe he has a – maybe here is the time when he would have totally done something completely different to his entire rest of body of work. But, yeah, I think it would have been a lot more kind of like um, much more bellicose or something. I don't know. Anyway, different meta-universe tangent. That film exists somewhere. (laughs) In a parallel universe. Yeah, that's right. The sliding doors of – Security card movies. Okay, let's jump to the box office. Which movie was the box office champ? Have a guess. I'm going to guess it was probably the movie that's had two sequels. <laughs> two? Really? Oh, we'll get to that. Paul Blart, More Cop, was made for $26 million US. It did US domestic gross of $146 million plus 
37 million foreign for a grand worldwide total of $183 million. Pretty good return on your money from a $26 million bet. Observe and Report made for $18 million, so similar budget. Did $24 million domestically plus only $3 million in foreign for a worldwide total of $27 million. So Paul Blart cleaned up. And actually, Paul Blart, Molkoff, is Adam Sandler's most successful film made through his company. Really? Yeah. More successful than Grown Ups. Surely Grown Ups made more. It must have made up. Yeah, I think you're right. Maybe that was an old fact. You look it up for me in the meantime. Now, Rotten Tomatoes. Have a guess. Which one wowed the critics and impressed the viewers? I'm going to guess that both of these films were poorly reviewed. Yep. (laughs) Paul Blart did 32% on the tomato meter with critics versus Observe and Report did 51%. And Paul Blart did 43% with audiences, which is pretty amazing given it made $186 million internationally, like in total, with a 43% score. And Observe and Report has an audience score of 37%, which surprises me. So basically, audiences didn't come out for the second Mall Cop movie, and if they did, they did not like it. Right. I think just jumping back, as of 2009, this Paul Blart might have been the highest box office grossing movie for Happy Madison. Since then, though, it's been eclipsed by all kinds of films. Actually, no, Anger Management did more money than it. So, don't know where you got your uh, that stat. It did do much better than Bucky Larson, Born to be a Star, though. So. <laughs> All right, let's get to the awards. Ding, ding, ding. Which film has the best title, Paul Blart or Observe and Report? Observe and Report. Although we're always here, Ben, you like the title that is- It is what it, it is. It is what it is. So is Paul Blart Mall Cop your favourite? I like Observe and Report. Right. But inter- interestingly, it was changed to Security Guard King for its German what? release because, because the Germans <laughs> suffered terribly in World War II from- the Germans that suffered terribly. And report. Well, sorry, I should say, yeah, the Jewish oh, Germans. Like Germans inflicted. Yes, observe and report had terrible connotations. And so for a comedy, it was deemed to not be the best title. So they chose Security Guard King. Well, this is a good moment mark. to say we still shouldn't um, forgive the Germans. Moving <laughs> <Okay>. on. <laughs> Controversial take on a Food Movies podcast. Yeah, that's, right. that's right. If you'd like to know more about my opinion on should or should we not forgive the Germans, please check out my other podcast. It's called Should We or Should We Not Forgive the Germans for World War Two and World War One. It's very niche. Yeah, well. Very niche. Yeah. So, Gabe, they're demonstrating international diplomacy at the highest that's level. Right. That's Gabe's opinions do not reflect the opinions of this podcast. <laughs> that's fine. Best poster. They're kind of similar, aren't they? No, Paul Blart has that goofy thing on even that segue and just being a Isn't muppet. that the Paul Blart 2 poster? I thought number one was just Kevin James staring out into space. You're right. Yeah, it's kind of actually a bit of an odd poster. It's just leaning in hard to the idea that Kevin James is trying to be serious. Right. Whereas at least the other one to me, which has the sort of weathered look, that kind of like the creased poster look, I like much more. So I'm giving it to Observe and Report. You? Yeah, observe and report. Neither of them are particularly interesting. I wonder if there's some much more coolly designed one that some part-time cool graphic designers made, but we're not talking about uh, neither of these posters is Jaws. I don't think Mondo is doing dedicated uh, promotional work, <laughs> retrospectives for Paul Blart, Morkop, or observe and report. So let's jump on to the Bill Fleck Big Break Award, named after American indie actors Billy Bob Thornton and Ben Affleck before they were famous. I had, for Paul Blart, I had Jamie Mays, who played Amy, who went on to do the TV series Glee, The Millers and The League. And under Observe and Report, I had the two twins, John Ewan and Matt Ewan, who played the characters John Ewan and Matt Ewan, respectively. What? I mean- I haven't seen those guys in... What else did they end up doing? Are they in some Arrested Development? They're in the Greasy Strangler? Not much. Not much. But they were great. So, any opportunity yeah, for you funny. to give them an award, I will give them an award over fake Anna Harris. Done. The Twins get the Bill Fleck Big Break Award. Okay, jumping on to the Before They Were Famous Award or the Blink and You'll Miss Them. 
I didn't have anyone for Paul Blart. There was no one recognisable that's kicked on. For Observe and Report, I Jesse Plemons, who played the character Charles. Yeah, I totally forgot he was in this, and he looks very young. I think he looks quite similar. Really? He's kind of yeah. got a skinnier head. <laughs> yeah, skinnier head. Yeah. I don't think as you get older, your head becomes fat. Of course it does. That's your neck. No, your whole head becomes fat. Your ears and nose never stop growing. Although, you did send me a picture of Gene Hackman earlier this morning, and he's definitely shrunk. <laughs> he's shrunk. He got old, his head got fat, and then he got very old and his head got little. So at six in the morning on a Sunday, I sent Gabe a photo from Instagram of Gene Hackman on an electric bike, and he looks like he's lost about 40 kilos. He's almost unrecognisable. I was actually a bit worried about him. And apparently, he spends his time now just riding around on an electric bike in somewhere small like Anchorage or San Francisco or somewhere. And yeah, having lost all that weight around his jowls, I almost didn't recognise him. Fuck, someone's got to get him so, out of ret- Like Scorsese got Joe Pesci out of retirement for the Irishman. Someone's got to get Hackman out. Anyway. Well, it would have been someone like Tony Scott, but tragically Tony Scott's passed on. But um, he would have been someone who he might have come back for. So, yeah, it's a shame. Okay, the Tommy Lee Jones Steeler Award, named after the iconic performance by Tommy Lee Jones in The Fugitive. Yeah, sorry, Paul Blart. No one stole the show and that film, unless you can think of someone, Gabe, who stepped up above and beyond the small role and did a lot with a small or poorly written part. Yeah, Alan Covert, man. Who's he? He plays jerky security guard. Jerky security guard. You'd recognise him. He's in like all right. of, maybe you wouldn't recognise him. He's in all of the Happy Madison movies. Maybe most famously is a sort of um, hobo caddy in Happy Gilmore, but he produces a lot of Adam Sandler's Movies as well. Okay. He's in Grandma's Boy. Wow. Alan You're naming all the classics. Okay. <laughs> hey, man. All right. Grandma's Boy. Grandma's Boy. If I keep saying it, Grandma's Boy. Grandma's Boy. Well, for me, Observe and Report takes it okay. for two reasons. Okay. For two people. Aziz Azari playing Saddam yep. and Danny McBride playing Caucasian Crackhead. Yep. Small roles. Did a lot with them. A lot of fun. Okay, but so we can't give this one to Michael Pena? Ooh. Was that just- Okay, that's fine. You can if you want to. I had him up later on for Chewing the Scenery. I'm giving mine to Alan Covert. Hi, Alan. Okay. Either way, Observe and Report wins. Okay. okay. The Dustin Diamond Award. Wait. Fuck. Who <laughs> didn't kick on? Now, I had the director of Paul Blart, Steve Carr. Have you seen his IMDb filmography since this film? No, did he it not do good. What is- So, let me, let me read out the films that Steve Carr did before Paul Blart. Okay, just to give you an idea. Okay. So, he did the ones that are most notable. He did like a few Jay-Z music videos in the late 90s. That's pretty good. Okay. Does Dr. Doolittle 2, big film. Does Daddy Daycare, pretty big film. Does a film called Rebound, which has Martin Lawrence. Okay, so does the sequel to Paul Blart. No, doesn't do the sequel to Paul Blart. And then basically does nothing at all, like terrible TV, terrible videos, and most recently in 2018, did a TV movie of Freaky Friday. Like, just terrible. It's interesting because the Happy Madison guys sort of seem to bring their directors back a lot. So yeah, maybe I, I, they just didn't have a good time with Steve. Maybe. Maybe Steve didn't deliver the goods. Did he not deliver the goods, <laughs> do you think? Well, it wasn't Adam a great Sandler's film. Like, what is this? What would it do, buddy? I'm doing the Adam Sandler hands. This is my shit Adam Sandler impersonation as you're watching. Love the hands. Imagine them. I also had then the, uh, the Ewan Brothers. They've done a few things, but not much. They've done like a few small roles, but I thought they were funny enough to have actually done more with their careers. So, I don't know. I'm going to give it to the director, Steve Carr of Paul Blart. Steve, your Dustin Diamond Award will be waiting in Australia for you at a time that is most convenient. The Winner Winner Chicken Dinner Award. Who came out on top of each of these movies? So, I actually had Kevin James. He wrote it. He stars in it. It made a mozza. He got a sequel and it kind of pushed his career beyond his King of Queens TV series. So After this, you're a movie star, Kevin James. That's what they said to him. He said, you conquered TV, <laughs> right. now you've conquered films. What's next? Exactly. Stunts. Well, that's what he did next. He did that movie, Here Comes the Boom, where he became a, a UFC fighter or whatever. Really? You know, yeah. He's, oh. like a, he's a high school biology teacher who becomes a MMA fighter to raise some money for his school. Okay, well, besides him then, anyone else in Paul Blart who you think is deserving of the Winner Winner Chicken Dinner Award? No. (laughs) Okay. And then for Observe and Report, I had director Jody Hill, who went on to make Eastbound and Down and Vice Principals. 
which I think means that he did the best in that film and got the most out of it afterwards. Yeah. I would guess that for someone like Seth Rogen on his trajectory as a, a movie star, Observe and Reports probably would be a, a movie that, that the executives would not look upon fondly. There would be a blip on no. his upward trajectory. Whereas, yeah, like you say, Jody Hill went on Eastbound and Down, a lot of rulage in that. Vice Principals, great show. Okay. We're giving it to which one? Paul Blart or Observe and Report? Aren't we giving it to Yodi Hill? Done. Best Dialogue Award. What's your favourite quote, if any, from Paul Blart? I have one line if you want to hear it. Okay, I'd guess. It's when they're fighting and he headbutts him and he says, no one wins with a headbutt. And it's not particularly funny, but I've always thought that. <laughs> that no one wins with a headbutt? Yeah. That's not true. Look at bloody soccer hooligans. They're always headbutting people and winning. God, Paul yeah, Blart, you can't even them, get right? that right. It must hurt them, surely. Yeah, terrible. What about Observe and Report? I didn't really have any that sort of jumped out. Oh, okay, I love the line. There was the one which... Where Saddam, played by Ziz Azara, says, Why the fuck would I want to blow up the Chick fil A's? It's a fucking delicious burger or something. Oh, yeah. That's funny. I like Ronnie's mum saying, I just want you to know I'm ready to make a change. And Ronnie says, You're going to stop drinking? And she oh, yeah, says, yeah. I'm switching to beer. I thought that was great. <laughs> Actually, That's my favorite as well. Okay. For me, then, based on that line alone, observe and report wins. All right. The Nicolas Cage Chewing the Scenery Award. For me, that goes out to Bobby Carnival and Paul Blart. And then an observant report, I've got Michael Penner. Oh, it's Michael Penner. All the way. He's relishing it. That wig he's got on, the, the sunglasses he drops to the bottom of his nose to look over. Just amazing. Michael Penner all day. Choices. Done. All right. The Taking a Paycheck Award, which speaks for itself. I was going to say Ray Liotta in observant report. Really? Ray's going to pay some bills. He probably does. I have no... I love Ray Liotta, but I'd imagine he's like on marriage number six and he smokes like nine packets of cigarettes a day. Yeah. That's the way I'd definitely. like to think of Ray. And that's not a knock. Love Liotta. You like cigarettes or you like- no, I like Ray Liotta smoking cigarettes. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. I always said Bobby Carnival for Paul Blart. I'm thinking Bobby made more money from Paul Blart than he made from the station agent. Yeah, probably. All right. So let's give it to Ray Liotta. The Stephen Toblowski Award for the uh, Hey, It's That Guy Award. I had Paul Blart, I had Peter Garrity, and Eric Avari, who played Vijay. Do you know him? No, who's- Ball guy, white beard, you'd recognise him. And oh, a certain reporter yeah. had okay. Patton Oswald in a small role as the toaster bun manager. Oh, yeah, he plays an arsehole, right? He's, yeah, he's good in that as a prick. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah, Eric Avari, very recognisable from The Mummy and Stargate. Sure. So which one are you going for? Paul Blart or-, or- Patton Oswalt in Observant Report. I just give it to Mr. Oswald. It's nice to see him playing a dickhead. Done. Dickheads don't always come last. The Delroy Lindo Award for great actors who aren't cast often enough. So I had, is it Kia O'Donnell who plays the lead baddie? Vec Sims in Paul Blart. I thought he was pretty good. And I have in Observant Report, the one guy I know you will say is definitely not cast enough is Michael Penner playing Dennis. And by not cast enough, you mean he should really be in every single movie. Yeah. Then give it to Mike. Done. The Memphis Reigns Award, inspired by the absurdly named character played by Nicolas Cage and gone in 60 seconds. So for me, this is easy. This is Paul Blart. Wins for the terrible name, Paul Blart. Yeah, definitely. Blart. Yeah. It's a great actual name from a screenwriting point of view, to give someone which just sounds like an incompetent tool. Yeah, that's right. Definitely, if you read that on the page, you'd be like, oh, I get who. You wouldn't need a, a description of the character in parentheses. You just need the name. You go, I get it. Yeah, he's not called he's Paul schlub, Trigger. You know? Yeah, or Paul Buzzcut. Stephen Schlub. Yeah, Blood is pretty much code for Schlub. Yeah. Okay. The Memento Award, name for moments you completely forgot about until you rewatch these movies. Well, I hadn't seen Paul Blart, so I can't answer that. I saw that for the first time, especially for this podcast. To be fair, Listeners, you said you've forgotten about the whole movie. Already. You could just watch it again and uh, yeah, so much joy. Exactly. For me, I've forgotten about the horny mum in Observe and Report. She was pretty funny. Yeah. Man, she's great. Okay. So now it's time to get to that part of the podcast, the Milking the Speed Cow Dry Award, named after the infamous sequel Speed 2. So imagine this. Gabe. Ben. We have an opportunity to make a sequel to one of the twin movies about incompetent security guards. It's either Paul Blart 
or observe and report. Now, Paul Blart has already had a sequel, which means really we've got to either do a sequel to observe and report or do another sequel to Paul Blart. Which one do we go for? What is the sequel? Is the sequel to Paul Blart, he's just a security guard again doing more security guarding? Can't recall. Right. Don't care. (laughs) Okay. So, I mean, I guess the reason I ask is because I feel like you'd want to – like you've done security guard. What would be the next step up of this? either of these characters, I guess, being well out of their depth, wanting a position of authority and abusing that? Okay. Well, here's the pitch for the synopsis for Paul Blart, More Cop 2. And we can work out if we want to do a Paul Blart Mall Cop 3 and take this story elsewhere. After six years of keeping our mall safe, Paul Blart has earned a well-deserved vacation. He heads to Las Vegas with his teenage daughter before she heads off to college. But safety never takes a holiday when duty calls and Paul Blart answers. Okay. So, so essentially, it's basically taking the same premise and placing it elsewhere outside a shopping so mall. So they've just done the diehard thing like, oh, how can the same thing happen to the same guy twice? Exactly. Thrice. Twice. First of all, which one are we going to do? Paul Blart 3? Because I'm thinking the studio wants Paul Blart 3 more than they want Observe and Report. Yeah, but you know what? The studio doesn't know what they want until you give it to them and then it gets put out there and makes a trillion dollars. So, like, surely the character of Ronnie is a more interesting character to take somewhere else. Okay. We don't want to just rehash. We don't want, you know, Ronnie goes to Vegas or Ronnie goes to – and just the same thing happens. I'm thinking take a page out of the Ernest movies and, like, Ronnie joins the army or something. How about this? What if we do a spiritual sequel but with Michael Penner instead? Oh, I like it. So, do a sequel to Observe and Report. Seth Rogen isn't available. We decide that he's paying – he wants too much money. So we go to the guy who's not cast enough, the guy who we always think should be in more films, and he himself could be Ant-Man rather than a supporting character in Ant-Man. We go to Michael Penner and we say, Michael, we want to do a film following your character in a sequel. Maybe it's a tale of redemption. Oh, It's going to be as dark as Observe and Report. It might even expand into being a TV series on Netflix. Who knows? But where do we go with a Michael Penner Observe and Report sequel. Well, what was the last we heard of him? He did say he was sorry for the way shit went down. And he took off with all the money and was going to live happily ever after on the round. Going to on par- the lamb. party in Mexico. Okay, so he's on the lamb in Mexico. Okay. Is there enough of his character to make a full film about? I mean, he's funny and he's got skills. He's got robbing skills. Like, maybe the money's run out. He's got to pull off another mall heist. So what if he has got a job at a mall with a plan of pulling off another mall heist, and then he calls on Seth Rogen's character, Ronnie, to join him, and they will let bygones be bygones, and this time Ronnie will actively participate in the heist because the heist is to take money from a corrupt shopping mall owner who doesn't deserve it. It's like the pitch of Fast Five in the Fast and Furious films. Take the money from someone worse than you. Okay, I feel, though, that Seth Rogen's character would still feel like a law was being broken and at some point potentially reveal himself as having gone undercover. So, you know, there's some allegiances flipping. So does he come down and help out initially and then reveal he's actually going to arrest his old friend? Initially. Just one question. Earlier you said Seth Rogen turned us down because he wanted too much money. Is it like Danny McBride has now taken over the role? Oh, yeah, we possibly could. Or we just basically pay Seth Rogen less because he's only appearing for five, he's only shooting for five days. Oh, it's an extended cameo. All right. Yeah. yeah, so what? So Michael Pena wants to take down the corrupt rulers. Is it a shopping mall in Mexico? Yeah. Okay, so in a violent part of on the Mexican American border. I don't know. Oh, so Sicario meets it's Observer a bit Rambo Last Blood. It's a bit dark, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Controversial uh, politics as well. I mean, I guess it could be like in the sequel to Prison Break the TV show, right? You had the first series, or the first few series in American jail, and then you mix it up by going to a South American. Was it a South American jail? I didn't I think it was a South that American show. jail. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, nor did I. But the owners of the new mall in downtown Juarez, they could be white Americans from across the border. And so, so in that way, Michael Pena. And they're exploiting people? Yeah, no. of course they are. Okay. And they're exploiting the local Mexican workers. 
So Michael Penner, with a sense of justice, has now gone undercover to do the same thing he did in Mall Cop. No, the same thing he did in Observe and Report. (laughs) And what happens then? Is it basically a heist film? So if the first film was basically like a diehard-esque film, an ordinary man in extraordinary circumstance, the extraordinary part being the fact that Ronnie was trying to catch a streaker and the ordinary part being that Ronnie was just a sort of humble security guard. Is Michael Penner just an ordinary guy pulling off an extraordinary heist? He's not an ordinary guy. He's got a problem with heroin. He's got a problem with actually doing things for the right reasons. He's a morally conflicted character. And does Seth Rogen's character join him or not? Yeah, he may as well for a a few minutes. And and you throw in Danny McBride's character there as white crackhead. He's running them all now. He's the big bad. Okay, he's the baddie. Okay, he's taking his drug money, moves south of the border, set up this... And now- He's using the shopping mall as a way to move drugs across the border. And what goes wrong with the heist? What's the unexpected challenge they have? Surely they need to overcome themselves. Like I said, Michael Pena, we've established, he's a fiend for drugs. Perhaps he, um, not unlike, say, Ben Mendelsohn in that um, Brad Pitt movie, Killing Them Softly, the night before the big heist, he's doing a bit too much smack. Okay. So then what's the third act challenge? What turns things towards the end when he realises that, is it himself? Is he let down by his own drug addiction? Or is there a surprise appearance of a big bad who appears and threatens to ruin the whole plan? Well, these movies, like, isn't Paul Blart, for instance, often these movies, I know we're not doing a sequel to Paul Blart, but about a character discovering that what they thought was their weakness is in fact their greatest strength. And they don't need to change for someone or be that person that someone else expects them to be. Truly being themselves was enough. We could take that idea and sort of, undercut it by Michael Pena's character revealing or Michael Pena's character coming to the conclusion that actually the smack-addled pervert version of himself is his best self and he uses the power of drugs to win the day. Uh, Temporary invulnerability, for instance, that they might provide super strength that um, doing some PCP might give him and that's- So it's basically in much of Marlon's glass- with an ordinary man showing extraordinary skills, albeit under the influence of ice and crack. That's exactly, <laughs> 100%. And he defeats the cartel boss and in a surprising move just takes over the cartel himself. And can we have one last twist that perhaps what he's trying to steal isn't actually money after all but something else? Oh, yeah, what is it? Maybe it's redemption. Maybe it's his kidnapped daughter. Something which isn't just money. Is there a way he could be continually talking about what he's trying to get is redemption and it turns out redemption is just a thing? Like redemption is just a handgun with the word redemption written on it. He's like, I got it. I got redemption. Or maybe redemption is like his rosebud. Like uh, it's his childhood toy. It's the deeds to his parents' house. It's um, his long lost wife's wedding ring. Yeah. like What do you think? What could, what could it be? Well, whatever. It's his dog. It's Sir John Wick. Oh, there you go. Redemption is his dog. He's trying to get back his puppy called Redemption. Moral Redemption is for fucking pussies. But a little puppy called Redemption. Oh, yeah. No, that's great. Who's excellent. Yeah. And we need a title before we finish this. The producer's looking at his watch. He's tapping his toes. We need a title. Observe and report colon Mexico. Taking sort of a page out of those. What's that TV series about the, you know, Colombia and the, the Medellin cartel when they just did a- On Narcos. Narcos. So, it's just like, nah, you could just call it- Or Sicario, Day of the <laughs> Salando. Yeah. Dennis. <laughs> Dennis. Dennis. Done. <laughs> Dennis. Did a movie called Dennis. Okay. We're going with Dennis. All right. Sure. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you make a sequel to Observe and Report, which we've called Dennis. I cannot wait to see the box office returns for a movie where taking PCP as a means to gain superpowers is a heroic <laughs> move and a movie of called The Name of Dennis. Sure. It'd be adorable if Michael Pena does it. I mean, he can basically turn any dark-hearted moment into something delightful. So I'm buying a ticket. <laughs> you and three more people. The three best people in the world. And that brings us to the end of the show, Gabe. Where can the three best listeners in the world and more 
find your work and musings this week. I'd be lucky if I had three followers on Twitter. On Twitter, at Gabe Dowry. And I'm at Ben Phelps on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube.com slash Ben Phelps. You can find all my podcasts there, including this one, Twin Movies, in all the usual places, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. Thanks for listening, folks. We hope you enjoyed the show. Take care and stay tuned for another exciting, dazzling Twin Movies battle very soon. Adios, Gabe. Dazzling. Bye, Ben. Thank you.